So this is the Mantis Hexapod walking machine. It's a six-legged walking machine that was developed for, well, to test two things, really. It was to test whether the software that I developed on smaller machines would scale up to larger machines for a possible industrial application and as a creative engineering project. So we're trying to cover two things in one. The software on board here was developed originally on my much smaller ones and that was always called the hex engine, the hexapod engine. And then for this larger machine, the hex engine had to evolve quite a lot because it turns out that there are all sorts of issues with um, the weight of the machine, that, the, where the software no longer worked. It worked very well on the insect size machines, but when the scale got up and the mass went up, it all broke apart. So the hex engine, as I called it, got completely redeveloped and there was all sorts of safety features that went into it. And it also went from a microcontroller, uh, it was actually a DSPIC controller, uh, and I ended up putting it onto a Linux uh, embedded system, which is actually a 486 running at 100 megahertz with a real cut down Linux system that boots in seven seconds. Uh, and that's called the hex engine, and that is the core of the control system. The hex engine basically does all of the inverse kinematic mass and all of the control algorithms, the gate generation and all that stuff. And it talks to six control stations on each leg, which are basically DSPIC processors running uh, PID loops. And they close the loop on each leg for each axis on each leg. And they're all sat on a CAN bus. So the hex engine's basically sending out what angles the legs need to be up. And they're just doing the closed loop stuff. And they're also monitoring some of the uh, data, such as the sensors on the leg and sending it back to the hex engine. Then there's also an Ethernet network on here, which is talking to a Windows CE user interface. Uh, and that's about a 25 second boot system. It's out of a tractor actually, like screens you get in tractors, um, which has been reprogrammed for this purpose. And that has all of the information to the driver. So it's like a bird's eye view of the machine. I can see what all the legs are doing. Uh, I can change configuration. I have your engine control panel, if you like, so revs and flow rates and oil pressure, that kind of thing. So that's all on an Ethernet connection. Uh, and in fact, that the reason why it's on an Ethernet connection, and that also talks to the joysticks in the cab. They're actually on another CAN bus, but they talk to the Windows CE machine. The Windows CE machine's on Ethernet because it was also on Wi-Fi, and you can take all those controls out of the cab and run it via Wi-Fi remotely. Um, so basically the, the core is running more real time and the user interface is a part of an offline system. It doesn't need to be there. If it crashes, the machine isn't going to fall apart. Does it worry you that it can be remote controlled? No, not really. Um, I mean, you know, it's not the best of security. I could probably up it a bit. It's only quite low level Wi-Fi security, but then someone would have to figure out my protocol that I wrote that goes on top of that to control the machine. So, you know, it's only ever on for 15 minutes at a time. If anyone can figure that out, do you know what? I'd shake their hand, so. So inside the cab here, we've got a joystick on each side and then a bunch of buttons, which I don't label up for, uh, for reasons just to confuse people. Only I know what they do. These are on a CAN bus that just talks to this module over here, which is this robust TFT screen, touch screen, and has a bunch of buttons down the side. And this is my uh, operator driver view panel, if you like. Uh, so this is where I can see everything that's going on with the machine. I can select certain modes and I get um, um, uh, questions fed up from the hex engine to here, like do you want to do this, do you want to do that, are you ready to power up and so on. And then on the left hand side over here I have another a more basic control panel. So this is RPM, flow rate, uh, oil pressure and temperature. So it's basically, if this goes down, I can still see all of that stuff here. And this also has the big kill switch and the key start. So this is more like the engine control panel of a normal car. Uh, and this is more like a fancy dashboard version. So this is tethered via ethernet down to the, the hex engine, uh, the control system, which is around the side here. So if we come around the side, sat up underneath the driver's chair here. So this is my um, 486 stack in here and a can. It's a PC-104 is the um, modular size. Uh, and in these really nice robust cans and there's two CAN buses coming out the bottom here and then there's the Ethernet connection. It's powered through the CAN bus connector here and then there's another connector here which is a serial connector and that's going to a little IMU measurement system so I can um, basically correct the body attitude according to gravity and level the machine off. So this is quite a nice little unit and there's a very convenient little reset button just under here somewhere so I can do a, I can do a soft reset when things aren't going right. <laughs> we just reach down under the seat. What's, um, what's um, your Linux built around? What's the... uh, gosh, it's a long time ago now, but it's basically the whole, the, the whole core was built on a build root system and it was just stripped down to the bare minimum. And it was, a, I think the, 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 uh, the processor board in there was by a company called Vortex, I think, off the top of my head. And they already had like a version of you know, stripped down Linux running. I just took that and stripped it back further, added on some stuff for the CAN bus and things, and, 
built it back up from there, but I'm, I'm sure it was called a Vortex board from, from what I remember. And that was probably all based on some kind of Debian-based um, uh, initial version, I guess. It doesn't yeah. look like a prototype. What's yeah. You know, I come from the film industry and the creative side of me can't just let it, I've got to look aesthetically pleasing. I was talking to someone today, you know, half of my problem with this is that I couldn't let things go. And I could have, because it would have been fine, it would have worked fine. Like I wanted to seal up the whole of the engine bay and stuff like that and in the end I ran out of time and energy and actually most people want to see the engine so it would have been silly if I did. But uh, the aesthetics are important to me but they're not needed to operate. <laughs> um, the cab looks really cool but the whole thing's removable so you can take the cab and the seat off and then you could have a different deck layout on there if you wanted to. Uh, so yeah, no, it's... Um, I don't know why I have to make things look good, but you know, why not? I did have an investor um, for this project because we did have commercial interest in it. Um, yeah, it's the price of a, a house, you know, it's, it's not cheap. And I did three years of my own time on this and I wasn't paid, so it was three years out of work for me as well. Um, and it really, to be honest though, if you were going to build something like this, um, I say properly, because we did do a proper job, but if you did it with a team, a proper team of people, I'd say this is five to six people. And I would say this is one to two million pound project if you did it for a company properly, you know. We did it as best we could on a, on a much smaller, much, much smaller budget, but still in significant, a significant budget, much smaller. And half of the issue I had with it was trying to do so many things on my own. I had to be the hydraulics expert, the engine expert, the software expert, the electronics ex expert, and I'm only two of those things, you know what I mean? So it was a real tricky project. What it does at the moment is about one mile an hour. That is limited more about from the mechanical structure than it is from the, the hardware of the machine. I built it to go up to four miles an hour, so I have capacity in the pump and flow rate for four miles an hour. I think it's probably closer to three miles an hour now I've studied it. Um, but it's actually limited by, there's too much flex in the legs in this direction. Uh, the joints needed to be much stiffer on the legs uh, up here and down here. We need to make them much bigger, probably twice as big as what you see now. And then maybe if I had that stiffness in the Y axis, as I call it, in the, which is in a straight line, then we might have been able to get up to two mile an hour at least, or three miles an hour. Well, and that would have been- speed a, isn't the thing here, is it? It's not about speed at all. It's never been about speed. Um, you know, it has a foot pressure when it's standing on six feet, the same as a human foot standing on one foot. So it does very little damage to the terrain. Uh, it was never about a speed thing. All they needed was a machine that would cope with rough terrain and have lots of traction in rough terrain. Um, and yeah, it's to me, it's speed isn't an issue. I know it bothers a lot of people. Number one YouTube comment, it's too slow. But you know, people don't <laughs> understand real physics of stuff. So well, it's pretty much for shows now, I think. I mean, we would like to do something else with it. I'd love to move it on to a company or a museum or something like that. I'd be happy for a museum to take it if they had the right money. Um, the problem is now that obviously it's you know it's an aging machine, it's five years old now, and it needs a lot of tinkering to keep it going. So to sell it to someone as a working entity would be quite tricky because obviously you know someone's got to maintain it. And every time I get it out, there's something that needs adjusting. So uh, yeah, I don't know what the future will be. How'd you get it here though? So it goes on a trailer, that trailer over there. Part of the whole design process was how are we going to move it around? And so we built it in a way that the front legs fold in, these middle legs fold right the way back flat to the body, so they have an extra range of motion on them. It basically lifts itself above the trailer, you drive the trailer underneath and it drops itself back on and folds up. Technically speaking, no lifting gear required. This episode of Computer File was brought to you by Audible. Well, we all know Audible, they're the audiobook people. And if you go to www.audible.com slash Computer File, you can start a 30 day free trial and the first book is free too. You can also text Computer File to 500 500. I like listening to audiobooks when I'm in the car. And the great thing about Audible is, unlike a streaming or a rental service, you actually own your books. Today, I'd like to recommend Rise of the Robots, Technology and the Threat of a Jobless Future by Martin Ford. Can accelerated technology disrupt our entire economic system? And will there be any such thing as a skilled job in the future? Check out Rise of the Robots by Martin Ford. Go to www.audible.com slash computerfile for the 30 day free trial and the first book for free. Or you can text computerfile to 500 500. <laughs>